good man. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A welcome to the first event of the Friends of the South Gray Museum's 2024 speaker series. Uh, this is a good one. I see a lot of birders in the audience. And I see, oh, I see Deputy Dane Nielsen is here. And Jessica, hi. And uh, I saw Joel Lawhead. Hi, Joel. Who's your date? <laughs> Welcome, young man. Good to see you. So as we begin this evening's presentation, we're calling it Birding in the Valley, we'd just like to formally recognize that we're meeting on Ashinaabe ter territory. So now to our guest, where'd he go? There you are, okay. Many of you already know David as the proprietor of the local color art gallery in Flesherton. And he's also served his community as a counselor for the village of Flesherton and then as well as a counselor for Artemisia Township. But David is particularly well known as our local birding authority. Thanks to all the bird watching tours he's led. And he's introduced participants to the 227 plus species of birds that he's identified in the Beaver Valley. Sometimes as many as 50 in one single yard. Talking about Barry Penhale's place out in Ceylon. According to David, some of the more interesting birds seen locally are the waterfront fowl that we greet each spring and fall as well as the grassland species that are always thriving locally. However, uh, due to the climate emergency that we're all facing, birds included, David warns us that some bird populations are diminishing. Sadly, that's the swallow and martin family. Now, over a decade ago, David brought birders together by forming the Beaver Valley Birding Club, which continues to expand to this day. The club's Facebook page now has 770 followers who post their photos and share their findings with like-minded birders. And this evening, to tell us more about those initiatives and to share what he's discovered about these beautiful creatures, their environments, and their habitats, Will you please welcome the Birdman of the Beaver Valley, <laughs> Mr. David Turner. Come on up. Oh, there's a lot of you. So I, I, I don't actually call myself an authority or an expert. I'm a very enthusiastic birder. In fact, there's a couple of birders I see here who are actually better birders than I am. I'm just pretty enthusiastic and loud about it, so. So, where's my man with my slides? Has it got it? Ah, the Beaver Valley. This is what we're gonna talk about. Different habitats and, and different birds that are throughout the Beaver Valley. So as you know, the Beaver Valley is this beautiful, beautiful, expansive place. Starts roughly just outside of Flesherton, heads from Meaford to Collingwood, and contains many different habitats in between. So we're gonna go over about five different habitats for you and uh, show you some of the birds out of there. There's a lot of pictures of birds. Uh, <laughs> so there's probably more pictures than talking. Yeah, thank you, Tim. <laughs> it's not going. I am, that's where I'm pointing it. You got it? Oh, okay. So, I guess technically the Amic sewage lagoons, but we all call it the, the Kimberley sewage lagoons, um, may seem like a strange place to bird, but sewage lagoons the world over are some of the best places to bird. There is a lot, a lot of things for them to eat there. So they go. Uh, this one in particular is uh, Gray County's number one hotspot for birds. So far, there's been 196 species seen there. So that encompasses uh, bits of grassland around with trees. This is the, the smaller of the two lagoons, which is the most active. 
And then all around it, there are these um, plantations and grasslands for other species to come in. Some good wet forest. And this is the, the next lagoon. All right, so now we're going to get on some birds. So this is a northern shoveler. And this duck is here right now. Um, it's a uh, massive, massive beak. This one's the male. And they pass through both in the springtime and in the fall. And then we move on to, this is a common yellowthrope, one of the warbler species that occurs there. Often find these guys, most often find these guys around water. A common but beautiful bird. This is the wood duck. This is the male. And he's related, they're related to the mandarin duck. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of mandarin ducks, but these are related to those. This is the American wigeon. The ducks really, really like to, uh, to feed on the, on the lagoon because there's a lot, a lot of algae and uh, plant matter. These are all dabbling ducks. There's two kinds of ducks, dabbling and diving. Dabbling ducks are the ones that stick their heads on the butts in the air and, and collect the, the plant life. Sparrows. This is another migrant that's on its way through at the moment. This is the fox sparrow. You might actually even see these in your backyard if you look now. One of our two species of wax wings. Um, you can't clearly see it on this one, but the wax wings called that because they excrete wax. And those little red tips or yellow tips that you see on the wings is wax that they excrete. And as far as I know, nobody knows why they do this. So this is a northern shrike. And this comes down in the winter from the north. It's a songbird, but it's a predatory songbird. Uh, its common name is butcher bird. And it's called a butcher bird because it likes to catch small birds and reptiles and mammals, and then it hangs them on spikes. So uh, hawthorns, buckthorn, and barbed wire fences, it will catch them, take them, and hang them on there. And the shrikes occur all over the world, and they all seem to do it. And this is a, one of the smaller herons we have. This is a green heron. These guys um, actually nest in evergreen trees, and there's plenty of those around the lagoons for them to nest in. So this is usually our first warbler that arrives, and they're here right now. This is a pine warbler. And this is a yellow rump warbler. You can't see it here, but it has a nice yellow patch right on its butt. These guys come through in the hundreds of thousands through Ontario. It's one of the most common of the warblers that you'll see. Some of them do stick around and breed here. Um, you'll find the occasional one breeding around this area. But they're, they're here right now, and there'll be more and more coming. And there's, if you get down to any of these locations, you will run into these guys at this time of year. Another warbler. This one's the palm warbler. Sparrows. I have a thing for sparrows. <laughs> this is a swamp sparrow. As you can see, lives in, it does like to live in wet areas where you find reeds and stuff. One of the classic poses, like, like the marsh wren, this guy will do with a leg on, on two different reeds. Look really nice. And a bird that's fairly common all through the summertime in this area. This is the yellow warbler. This is a male yellow warbler with the, the red dots on it. And you'll see these guys in fairly large numbers when you're out in the woods. And when they start to nest, they get a little more quiet, so they're not so much around then. And this is the female sitting on the nest. So this nest was about this high off the ground. Right, right in the lagoons, and uh, a tent caterpillar nest next to it. And one day I went back to see what was happening, and it was gone. So that, because they nest so low, you know, predation happens in the wild. Occasionally you'll see, <laughs> I was going to label all the photos, but there was rather a lot of them, so I didn't. <laughs> so every once in a while you'll see one that pops up that's got this on. This is probably our rarest wren in the area, the sedge wren. This guy really likes grasses. Not so much bulrushes, but like grasses and things like that that you see around. 
And it's a very uncommon bird in the valley, but really beautiful to see. And I put this one in because these guys breed at the sewage lagoons. These are the birds. This is a female hooded maganza with its two chicks. So these guys, although the ducks, their cavity nest is in trees. So they nest in trees, not on the ground. And probably our, our rarest visitor to the sewage lagoons, this is a least bitten. Okay, quite a small little bird. And he, he also climbs reeds very, very well to fish along the edges. One of the winter finches that comes down, are the, this is a pine grosbeak. So these guys come down in the winter time when the food source in the north isn't good. So if, the, if it's a bad year in the north for, for seeds, they'll come down here. Okay, so one of our two species of cuckoos. This guy is the black-billed cuckoo. These guys are often found around the sewage lagoons in, in Kimberley. So this bird eats uh, tent caterpillars and four webworms, which its favorite, its, its most favorite food. So they're really, really nasty, prickly little caterpillars, those things. And these guys will break into the nest and, and just tear the nest apart and eat them. But because they have such spiny uh, outside skins, it clogs into the, the cuckoo's belly, so the belly, the, the belly sloughs off at the lining, and the cuckoo spits it up like an owl pellet, and then grows in, and then has a new lining to its stomach underneath. Yeah. And I saw her. So this is the last bird. This bird, um, if you're out near any wetlands, you hear way, way more than you'll see it. They don't like to come out into the open very often. This one just popped out when we were there one day, which was really fortunate. So just one other thing, um, because the, the sewage lagoons there are such a great, a great place to bird, I would encourage everyone to go there because there might be some development going on fairly close, which will put an end to how many species are there. It, that kind of pressure on, on the birds and that kind of noise while the development's going on will keep them away, especially the waterfowl. Um, the smaller birds, it won't affect as much, but the larger birds, the ducks and things like this, and the bitterns and the herons will probably stay away once development starts to come there. So we'll probably lose our number one site in, in Gray County, and it'll, it'll revert back to Wyatton. The Wyatton sewage lagoons are the second uh, hotspot in Gray County. All right, so we're going to move on to the big water, well, the big water inland. So Lake Eugenia. Uh, lake Eugenia, of course, is, is I, I just took the one photograph of the lake because it's just a big water. But all around are these little bays and little inlets that have lots and lots of habitat for, for waterfowl and water birds. And then the causeway, which is the best place to bird from. And Anybody who lives around here knows what that is. Oh, hold on, I got it. Is it working? Yeah, right there. These guys. Actually, these guys are from side road 35. This is the other nest that's there, because there are two, two nesting sites on the causeway. I'm just going to drop back again. Um, this nest uh, has had ospreys in it for the 33 years that I've lived here. Every year there's been a nest there. And so the young are coming back or others are coming back and occupying it. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I was really happy to see that. Um, although it's a bit, little bit inconvenient because we do love to park there when we're gonna, when we're gonna bird there, but there's the, the no parking zone has gotten a little bit closer to keep people away. So if you are ever out and you wanna take pictures of these guys or see them, just stay away a little because they do get harassed quite a bit. And that's what they look like in the nest. Our other famous raptor from the lake, um, the best place to see a bald eagle anywhere in the Beaver Valley is Lake Eugenia at any, any time of year, especially if there's some open water and they can hunt. Um, 
in the springtime, they really like to pick at the fish that get frozen in the ice. That's what this guy was doing. He would go down and pick at a frozen fish and then come back out. Because more than anything, bald eagles are scavengers. They do hunt a bit, and they will steal um, fish from osprey, but they, they mainly are scavengers. This, and this is Ontario's largest eagle. Um, people often think that the golden eagle is larger, but this actually is the, is the big one we have. We, so in the springtime, Lake Eugenia is home to a lot, a lot, a lot of migrating waterfowl. Here's a bit of a mixture, but the thing that we get here in large numbers, if it works, are tundra swans. So these are, these are mainly tundra swans. And all that white you can see on the water that looks like dandruff, that's their feathers. And there are so many of them that come here some years. This year, they were really early. So that because of the weather, they were in and out fairly early. I don't know what happened there. So they'll come in. And these guys are uh, cross-continent migrators. So they winter down. Uh, in the southeast, like Florida, Carolinas, and places like that, and then they come across continent, sort of northwestish, and up into the tundra to nest, and then come back, but not in so many numbers. But Lake Eugenia has become what's known as a staging area, and staging areas where birds gather in numbers on their migration routes. I don't know why I've got my notes on. <laughs> so other other waterfowl that we get in large numbers on the lake are. Ring-necked ducks. I know it's... <laughs> so, you see... I'll come back. <laughs> I'm not having much luck with this. So these guys are actually called ring-necked ducks, even though they have a bill that is most visible with a ring on it. But yesterday, yeah, we got to see one do a full stretch, and you could actually see the ring around its neck. Some birds do kind of have a name that you think should be something else. <laughs> These are the tundra swans flying in. And these are one of our um, indigenous swans. We have two, uh, this one and the trumpeter swan. Okay, quick bit of a rant. Um, the mute swan that everybody loves so much is a very aggressive, invasive species that uh, we don't really need around. Um, I've seen them kill a Canada goose. Uh, and they, in certain areas, uh, depleted the population of indigenous uh, swans. The, the trumpeter swan, in particular, really, really suffered because of the, the mute swans. So even though they're cute, you know. This is one of our Arctic species that comes down from the winter and winters here. So during migration, birds move. So we get birds that come in the spring and summer that go south. But south uh, here, is where these birds come. So this is a buffle head. This is a male and female buffle head. And these are very small ducks. These are diving ducks. So you'll see these guys all of a sudden disappear and they're under the water, they're looking for mollusks and things like that to eat. And this is another one of the Arctic birds that comes down. This one's the common golden eye. And this one also is on the lake. As long as there's open water, this guy will be out there. So if it doesn't freeze up in the winter, there'll always be a few of them. All right, so this is the common meganza. So really, really short bill. Looks kind of weird for a duck in its kind of bill, and that's the female. So the common meganza, he's the deadbeat dad of the, of the bird world. So he will, they come here in the spring, all colored up, they'll mate, and then all the males leave. And the females raise all the young, and you'll see them communally often out on the lake or on the, big war, on the big lakes in huge rafts, in huge numbers. And then later on in the fall, the males seem to show up again. <laughs> and this is another meganza. This is a red-breasted meganza. I have a real affinity to him, being an ex-punk rocker myself. This guy's got a wicked mohawk. He's a lovely bird. <laughs> And this one's our third, this is the third meganza. This is the, the hooded meganza, the one that, I, that you saw earlier on that had the little babies that nest here. And there is another picture later on when you can see him with his, with his, his hood full up. Another, another fairly small bird. All right, from a distance, this, this just looks like a regular duck. This is a gadwall. But close up, you can see the absolute beauty of this bird. 
All right, so just because it's common and it's everywhere doesn't mean it isn't beautiful. So the mallard, which is everywhere. So in recent years, I no longer refer to them as mallards. I now call them mallards because I think it makes them a little more exotic. <laughs> and, and that way, maybe people will you know, take a little more notice of them. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, if the sun's on them right, that head looks blue, not green. And really, interest, and really interesting birds. And like I say, a common bird, don't not look at it. You know, you can spend all your time looking for rare birds and hard birds, and you've got all this beauty around you. The iconic Ontario bird. Uh, they don't nest out on the lake. They kind of stop through every once in a while, but the common loons are always a, a treasure to see. And we don't get a lot of them on Lake Eugenia, but the, they do come. And this one's a blue-winged teal. And one of the grebe species. So this is a pied-billed grebe, as you can see, named because of the black and white bill. And this one's really, really colored up for, for breeding. And they, they do breed out on, on the lake. And once again, often heard, and you can't miss them when they're flying. And if ever you doubted that dinosaurs turn into birds, listen to these guys when they're flying, because they really, really sound like them. And they nest out at the lake, in, in, around the periphery of, of the lake. So we always have a few here all the time. And this one is in what's called um, inky plumage. So sometimes the plumage is a bit rusty like this. But this one is a, is a full adult too. All right, so this is a Virginia rail. And you know the expression, as skinny, as thin as a rail? When this guy turns sideways, he is indeed incredibly thin, and that's so he can move in and out. And once again, a bird that is pretty difficult to see. He's pretty difficult to find, these little guys. I, he was making a lot of noise one day when I was there. I was there actually looking, looking for the sandhill cranes and photographing the sandhill cranes. And I heard this guy, and I looked down, and he was like, fortunately, like right at my feet, and then he was gone again. We get quite a few gulls, but this one, this one's a bit of an exception. So this guy's not in breeding plumage. This is a Bonaparte's gull. They're little, a little tiny like this. And right now in the summer, their heads are completely black, and they're all they're moving through. So we do occasionally get them. Another one of my rants, there is no such thing as a seagull. <laughs> they're all gulls, they're all different gulls. There's ring bill gulls, herring gulls, Bonaparte gulls, little gulls, they're, they're all gulls. And a lot of these birds that we see here probably have lived in the Great Lakes all their lives and have never seen the sea. But there actually is no bird called a seagull. <laughs> you get your birding license revoked if you do it. So. <laughs> So we do get a few, we do get a few shorebirds who, that come through. Um, this is a sandling in its, uh, in its winter plumage, its non-breeding plumage. And this is one of the few that occasionally stop and, and feed around the edge of the lake. So this guy's come down, bred in the Arctic, bred up on James Bay, places like that, and then come down here. And they, they start their migration fairly early because it gets cold up there a lot faster than it does down here. And uh, that's the swamp sparrow again. I, I really like swamp sparrows, so he, he gets two. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to go to a spot that probably not many of you know uh, in the valley. This is Little Germany. Little Germany, I mean, there's a couple of you know where it is. Um, this is on the road into Little, there's a little conservation um, area. If you're going towards Duncan out of the valley, when the road swings around, there's kind of a dirt road that goes down there, and it has no winter maintenance at a certain point, and you can't actually even get through it in the summer. Great birding area, because nobody's there. There's, there's, there are like four-wheelers go through, but not a lot. But it's got interesting habitat. So it has this wetlands like this, wet shrublands, and that goes, then it goes back up into the escarpment. Looks a bit greener in the summer. And then these are the roads. So they're not populated. And these woods are very, very wet. Uh, and when you're looking for birds, especially migratory birds, like warblers and stuff, you don't really want to be in the woods. You want to be somewhere like this. 
like on the edge, where the insects are easy to see, where the insects are moving around. Well, the, the woods get quite dense there. That's the dirt track that goes through. But you're, you're like, even a monster truck, I'd have a hard time getting through that. But there's really, really great plants in there too, for anyone who's interested in plants. There's actually walking ferns and things like that down there. All right, another one of our shorebirds. Um, this is a Wilson snipe, and he, he's gonna be losing his name soon because um, birds that are named after people are gonna have their names changed. Because Latin and Greek are the languages that are used to give birds names, and they're very, very descriptive. Like, anything that's in Latin actually describes something, it means something. So they're gonna start changing these all into, into different Latin names, so it will describe it, what it is, and the name Wilson will be taken away from it. Sorry, Guy. But, but he, he uses that incredibly long beak to probe into soft earth, looking for food. And often the best time to see them is when you're just driving along and there'll be one sitting on a post like this. Just be sitting there and all running out across the road. We saw one yesterday, it flew and then landed and on the road and then it ran across the road in front of us. All right, so there are many, many flycatchers in Ontario and there are a couple that are really identical the willow flycatcher and the older flycatcher. And when you see them, if they don't call, basically if you're a lister or you use eBird, you generally would mark them down as a trails flycatcher because you won't know what they are. This one is a willow flycatcher, and the reason I know that because it was calling, and it has a really distinctive sort of Fitzbue sound that it makes that you can really, really hear. But if they're not singing, you won't ever be able to tell it apart from, from its, uh, its necks of kin. This is the uh, white-throated sparrow, and they live out in uh, Little Germany in really, really large numbers, and it's one of the best places to go. If nothing else, go up there to hear these guys. These guys have a really, really cool song. The song is kind of like, my sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. And apparently, this is a new song. And years ago, their song was different, and they somehow have changed it. I've never met anybody who knew the old song, so <laughs> maybe it's older than that. But Beautiful, beautiful bird, beautiful song. Teeny little bird. This is a uh, golden-crowned kinglet, so little tiny bird, and they pass through in fairly, fairly large numbers in the spring and fall migrations. And they're here right now, but they'll be going off. Really, really soft, high-pitched call. So um, take a young person with you or have pretty good hearing. <laughs> Young birders are the best. Um, sorry, Eric, I'm going to point you out. Young birders are the best because they have like super hearing and super eyesight. Like most birders are like a bit older. I mean, there's a lot of young birders, but a lot of, and our hearing and eyesight, you know, it's not as good as it was. Befriend a young birder. <laughs> <laughs> and what birding is, is a, a hobby that um, it, it crosses the age barrier. Like, you see people out, you know, my age and older than me with fairly young, really young people. It's, it's really a really wonderful thing to see because you've got something in common immediately, right? And birders can be a little nerdy and a little geeky. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Another one of our wrens. This is the winter wren, and they do sometimes winter over. Another bird that's difficult to see because it skulks in um, shrubs and bushes in the woodlands and stuff. Uh, generally has its tail perked up like that and quite small and very, very chatty, although not as chatty as that one. So that's a house wren. And if ever you've had one move into your yard, as many people do, they really like to nest in your back garden. They do not shut up. They just like, <laughs> and they'll scold you and tell you off if you get close to their nesting box too. And another one of the shorebirds that's passing through. This one is a lesser yellow legs. And we do get graders, but not at the moment. 
Ah, now more warblers, a bit of warblers. That, this, that spot of a little Germany is fantastic for warblers. This one is a Cape May warbler. So I'm, the warbler pictures I'm going to show you are all warblers that are in their breeding colours when they're in migration. When they come through in the fall, um, the old birding books used to have a category that was confusing fall warblers because they lose their breeding colours and they get very similar to each other. And it, it's a good time, to, if you want to up your birding skills, go out warbler hunting in the fall. So this one's a Cape May warbler. And this one's a black and white warbler. Great camouflage. Like, although it, it looks like it would stand out, it has really great camouflage. This is another one of the warblers that breeds here. This is it again. And they breed fairly low, often in crooks of trees and stuff. All right, this is, the worst photograph I have in the display is this one, not only because, so that's an oven bird, which is a type of warbler. And anybody who's been for a walk in the woods here will have heard that bird. It's the bird it goes, it's, it's called it's teacher, teacher, teacher. And they're really hard to find and really even harder to photograph. So I got this one, I thought, oh, I've got a great shot of it. But then when I, you know, I got typical, I've got all these photographs, but I've taken thousands and, you know, I've got bird butts and branches and blurry birds in most of them, which is what this one is. This guy is called an oven bird because its nest resembles an oven and it nests down low on the ground. And this one uses twigs. Some oven birds in some places use clay and they build a nest down near the ground that looks like an oven. One of my favorite birds, this is a blue-headed vireo. And then Little Germany is one of the places where you can find them in their, during their migration. This is our smallest warbler that passes through. This is a northern parula. A magnolia warbler. Warblers are beautiful. They'll, if you want to get anybody into birding, take them out in the spring and find some warblers. They're, and they have beautiful songs too. Another one of our resident breeders that really can get people going on birds is, a, you know what that is, right? Indigo bunting. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. And another warbler, this is a black-throated green warbler. And this is a Canada warbler. So I didn't find them last year, but for the previous three years, these, this guy, these guys won territory singing there, which is usually a good indication that they breed. And this bird, that banding is a necklace that goes all around. So it's brilliant, brilliant lemon yellow with this black necklace around the male and this sort of gray blue on the back. An absolutely stunning bird. All right, so now we're going to move into another part of the valley. There's lots of pictures of birds. I hope you don't mind. Um, so the central valley is quite different from a lot of the, the other habitats. A lot of open grasslands. I can see them up there. So lots of, lots of open grasslands. And then, of course, the Beaver River, which runs all the way through the valley down there, and up into the hills. So we're going to move into grassland species now. So this is another migrant that comes very early and stays and breeds. This is an eastern meadow lark. So the numbers of the eastern meadow lark have been plummeting over the years, along with a lot of the grassland birds, because we lose them to habitat loss and uh, farming practices. So farmers were taking hay crop off earlier and earlier and earlier, and taking the nests out of this bird. Uh, the eastern bluebird nests in boxes. I'll get to another bird and carry on with that. So this, this bird, actually, we have a, a, a small resident group that stay in the valley all winter, which is really nice. Normally, they do migrate, and this one's in full color. So those boxes that you often see on posts and hedgerows and stuff, they're really to attract this bird. And this bird likes its nesting box near an open field or near some open land. And an absolutely spectacular bird. More sparrows. Got to have sparrows. This one is a savannah sparrow. And these are all like grassland birds. This one is a field sparrow, usually easy to tell because it's got a pink beak. And this is our largest sparrow that we get here. And this guy hasn't, hasn't arrived yet, but he'll be here really soon. This is a white crowned sparrow. So they come through in the spring and fall again. 
and a very large sparrow. Like when you, if you see it next to like your regular chipping sparrow or song sparrow, it's got a, it's, it's a chunky little thing. So this is our rarest sparrow and maybe our rarest breeding bird in the valley. That's a grasshopper sparrow. And this is another species that's really in danger because of uh, farming practices and stuff. Happy to say though that there um, is a big push on and groups going around and talking with farmers who are really coming on board about delaying the harvest and setting certain pieces of land aside so some of these birds can carry on breeding because they lost populations like crazy. This bird's call is truly like a grasshopper. It's soft and buzzy. And my all-time favorite sparrow is a clay-colored sparrow. It likes more shrubby habitat, so it would be in those shrubby bits just on the edge of the grasslands. And another warbler. This one's a Tennessee warbler. So warblers are generally insectivores, but this guy also eats nectar, and here he's eating nectar off a currant bush, off a wild currant bush, uh, to uh, bolster out his diet, or maybe he just has a sweet tooth. Uh, sorry, this, this, is, this is our other cuckoo. This is the yellow-billed cuckoo. Now this guy is probably less around than the black-billed cuckoo through Ontario. And once again, like cuckoos, cuckoos are known as parasitic birds mostly in the world, but this guy and the black-billed cuckoo don't parasitize nests very, very often here. So probably like one of the most popular of the grassland birds, this is the bobolink, and I, I get back to some of these farming practices now. So this bird uh, in the 1960s and 70s we lost about 60% of its population, maybe more, because um, the, the, the chicks were never fledged before the, the crop was taken off, before the hay crop was taken off. So their populations were just dying out. But because of um, changed farming practice, this bird is now making a really, really good comeback. Sometimes called the R2-D2 bird because it really does beep, beep like R2-D2 if you can hear him calling. And they'll do it while they're hovering and flying over the fields. And this one's, a, this one's a male. And they nest kind of really low down in the grass clumps too. Ha! I love this guy. <laughs> they look a tad nasty close up. But of course, a really fantastic reason why this bird has no feathers on its head. Because this bird sticks its head inside carcasses. And that wouldn't be a good thing <laughs> if it had feathers on its head. And moving up, it seems, uh, earlier and earlier, and uh, leaving later and later. As the, uh, the climate is warming up a bit, they don't have to go. So the, the things they, they don't predate, they scavenge on, are, are around longer. So generally, you find they'll arrive when, you know, groundhogs and things have come out of hibernation. They're a little dumb. They wander onto road, roadkill, and these guys are around to clean them up. Initially, they were moving up... Uh, at, around when um, livestock would be out. So uh, when they were calving or lambing and things like that. But they moved further and further and further and they're following the roads and highways north and that's why they're going further north. But this is a turkey vulture. This is generally the only, bird, only vulture we get in Ontario. There is occasional black vultures, but generally it's this one that you'll see. And you can always tell it if you, when it, because it rocks on the wing like this, like, and, and the other raptors don't do that. So if, you, if you, you look in the air and you see a great big bird and you think it might be an eagle or something, if it's rocking on its wings, it's a vulture. This is a brown thrasher. It's a particularly cool bird. So this bird has the largest song repertoire of any bird that we have here. It's figured maybe a thousand different variations of its song. And it's a really, really good mimic too. Not quite like as good as the mockingbird, but it can mimic other birds really well. And it generally sings its refrain twice. So each part of its refrain, it will, it will do twice and then move on to another one, do it twice, and then back again. And it might change the next time it sings. As well. Another one of our shorebirds, killdeer. And killdeer come here early and they're loud and they like parking lots to nest in and gravel and if you've ever um, 
go near the nest. This is the bird that does the broken wing. So the, the adult will pretend that it's got a broken wing and hop, uh, move like this, so you'll, the predator will follow, 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 and then it just flies off as, after it's taken it away from its nest inside. Our largest, uh, largest woodpecker in the valley. This one's a pileated woodpecker. This one's a male, so he's got the red cheek as well as the red head, and I don't know if you know, you know that's a big bird, right? And you can usually tell his holes in a tree because they're more oblong than round, or rectangular than, than round. Right, this is the bird that you want on any piece of property you're trying to save. This is a red-headed woodpecker, and this is an endangered species. If you find this nesting on a piece of property, then you've probably saved that property from every development or anything. Um, I have seen two in uh, all the years that I have birded in the valley. I've seen two in the valley. And this one just was very cooperative. But an absolutely stunning bird. And in flight, you can really see the black and white of the wings. It doesn't have any of the mottling on it, just solid black and white. And the males have this, like, pillow box red head like that. But they are, they are coming back a bit in the area, not so much in the valley, but in other parts of the area they are about. All right, another one of our shorebirds. This is a woodcock. So the woodcocks are here now as well, and it, like the snipe, has a very long bill for probing for earthworms and stuff into the soil. So I've never actually managed to find one. These guys do the coolest dance ever. Like, go home and look it up online. When they walk, they, they do this. And when they come out with their little chicks, they do it as well. So you'll see like the mom and the chicks behind them and they're all walking like this across the road. And this, this one came out onto the side of the road. So just a quick tip, if you ever see me in the valley, don't follow me close. Because <laughs> I'm liable to slam the brakes on and pull over really quickly, which is what happened here. And then I'm leaning out the window trying to take a photograph of him. And he ran back and then he, but he did come back out again, but was scared off by a motorbike, unfortunately. But another one of the, it is technically a shorebird. And these guys have seemed to have taken up um, residence in, in the center part of the valley and, and around um, the sewage lagoons. And a couple of years ago, they were onto the old talisman site. And too, this is a golden wing warbler. Uh, Eastern towhee, another one. Technically a sparrow, uh, or in that family. Got a great song, Drink Your Tea. Drink your tea. You know, being English, I had to love it. <laughs> and another one of the raptors that is often seen down in the valley in the flatlands. This is a, a, an adult male northern harrier. Oh, yeah, they've got his name, so you know. These birds glide beautifully, fairly low down and they can hover and move around. They're absolutely a treat to see. One of the joys of birding isn't just going out and seeing a bird and then moving on to the next one. It's finding the bird and then stopping still and watching it, and watching it behave and, and be a bird. And then you really know what that bird is, right? And you see these guys and other things. And also, sitting still can be a great way to find birds. If you go into the woods, you're moving around making noise, as stealthy as you are, and you can be in camo gear up the wazoo. They, if, you think you, if you think they don't see you, you're only fooling yourself. I, I wear Hawaiian shirts in the summer when I go birding because, you know, might as well. But if you go into a woods and find a place where you can sit and just sit there, or at the edge of a woods, and just sit there and see what happens then, it's... Um, a, a bit of a lesson I got from, from scuba diving. Sco the difference between scuba diving and, and uh, snorkeling is when you snorkel, you drop down on something and all the fish disappear and then you see a couple swimming around. When you're scuba diving, you go down and you just hang there and then they all come back out. The same happens with birds. If you can go and find a spot and sit there for a while and just be still and then you can really observe them being birds and then you'll see more than you actually thought you were going to see. Yeah, everybody loves owls. <laughs> it's just got to put your pick. We don't get snowy owls in the valley much. Two, yeah, I'm counting two that I've seen. And the last couple of years, none, and none anywhere, because the lemming population in the Arctic crashed. And last year, about 1% 
of uh, nests had fledglings in the Arctic. So we just didn't see them coming down, and this winter they weren't here again. I, have, I didn't see one this year. I know I went looking for one, and it wasn't where it was previously when I got there, but this one was, once again, like, don't follow close to me. <laughs> I was driving along, and this guy was just sitting on, on a pole like that, just looking at me. And owls in particular do not harass owls. Do not get close to them. If you take a picture of an owl with your cell phone, you are too close. Like, most of all my photographs, I don't have like great camera equipment. I have a point and shoot camera that's got a pretty good zoom on it. That's what all of these were taken off. But it's because it's got a pretty good zoom on it, I can be at a distance and then crop my shot. That bird, like in the original photograph, is like this. This is blown up so you can see it better. But particularly with owls, and also with owls, we don't divulge their locations in public. That's the one thing you don't do, because you don't want people going to them and harassing them. Because people love owls, and people, they want to see owls, and they, a lot of people, most people, just don't understand that the owl gets nervous. And the little owls that we have, this, we've got some beautiful little owls, they don't leave when you get close to them. They just get really stressed. And they'll elongate, and their eyes will bulge out. And, and you see all these photographs often on the internet of people taking owls, and you, say, you are just way too close to that pal. So just give these guys a bit of respect. And this one's a full adult male, white. The juveniles and females are black and white. Another one of the winter finches that comes down. This one's an evening grosbeak. And uh, you are, well, anybody who has feeders around in the last few winters will have probably seen these guys at their feeders. This one's a horned lark. And uh, a great time of year is like a few weeks ago to see birds like this and some of the sparrows and some of the early migrants. Like this shot is if it snows, go out and go down back roads and look at the edge of the roads because they can still find seeds and food around the edge of the roads. So they'll go there and looking, looking for them. A lot of birding is knowing where to look and a lot of it's luck. <laughs> All right, this is the other waxwing that we get here. This is a bohemian waxwing and no yellow in the belly, like nice russet on the tail. And most often, again, this is a winter visitor. There are still a few around right now, but they're pretty much on their way out of here. And this is just in a flooded field in the valley. So um, about halfway between Kimberley and Heathcote, there's a bit of a flat. And if you look to your left, there's a field there that's on a, like a real riparian forest where you, it looks like the trees are dying. There's a lot of, a lot of um, maples and stuff in there. That field floods every spring, and it's often really good for birds. So now we're going to move to another habitat. So uh, any, any boaters and kayakers, canoers and kayakers will probably be familiar with this. So this is side road 19 river axis. This is a second river axis on the way down. And right now, if you're a kayaker, go there because this is partially flooded, but you cannot see anything but water through those trees right now. And it's real fun to, to go through there. And the summer, this happens, but it's still kind of good and wet. All through those trails. And very, very, very wet woodlands. And once again, excellent road for walking down. They've raised this road now. That road, that road used to get flooded all the time. So they've raised it up a bit. And they've kept it narrow, which is good because it doesn't get as much traffic on it anymore. So it's really good to walk through. So excellent spot for large, large wading birds. Great blue heron. Other than the sandhill crane, you won't find a bigger bird around than this guy. Maybe the next one. This guy, the great egret, which are coming in ever increasing numbers into the valley. You see them more and more and more. That flooded field I was talking about is an excellent spot over the next few weeks to find these guys.
So this is the other kinglet, the other one of those tiny little birds. This is the ruby crown kinglet. And usually you don't see his crown. This guy was all upset because he could see his reflection and thought it was another one, so it started doing this. But that's a tiny little bird. He thought it was another male. Aha. Uh -huh. So once again, back to the common birds. This guy, this guy's beautiful, right? He's so cute and adorable and sings and makes many, many different noises, many noises. But also, if you find these guys uh, in the winter and other times when food is hard to find, always watch them because they know where food is and other birds follow them. And the other thing with chickadees, they've just, I don't know anyone, any CBC listeners, there was a great story about these guys. These guys can have tens of thousands of food caches and they remember where all of them are. And apparently, it's almost like, yeah, in their brain, it's almost like geomapping. They just know where they are. So they have small stashes of food in many, many places and they remember where they all are. So they'll come, like if you've got a bird feeder, You'll often, and you'll see this with other birds too, not hatches and other birds do it. They'll come to the feeder, they'll eat, but then they'll grab something and leave, and then they'll come back. Well, they're stashing that food for later on. So this is the hooded Maganza in his full glory. All right, so this, this location is an absolute spectacular spot for yellow-bellied sapsuckers. All right, so I'm sorry to my bird friends who've heard this story before, but I grew up in England, you can probably tell, um, and I was a bit of a birder there. I was also a kid, and I love cartoons, and Yosemite Sam used to use it as an insult to people, you yellow-bellied sap sucker. I thought it was like, I came here, and I, when I moved to Guelph in 1979, a friend said, hey, you want to come birding? I went, yeah, I went birding, went birding. And he said, oh, there's a yellow-bellied sapsucker. I thought he was joking. I actually thought it was a joke bird. I had no idea it was a real bird. But it's so beautiful. <laughs> and these guys are, are like, they, this time of year, they're drumming like crazy. Woodpeckers, some of the smaller woodpeckers drum. So a lot of that noise, the rat-a-tat-ing that you hear, if you listen, it's in a rhythm. They're not pecking for grubs. They found um, a nice hollow log or a bit of a log that resonates. They really like the side of a barn. And these guys also really like a good old satellite dish. Cause <laughs> and they'll come up and then they have a specific pattern. They drum out, they're the same as a call, right? To, to let other, other birds know that they're there. This is a palm warbler again. Another pine warbler. So one of, the, one of the thrushes that you'll find uh, in the valley is a, there's a couple, this one's a hermit thrush, the other one's a wood thrush. Um, so I, I, didn't I didn't bring photographs of all the birds I've seen in the valley because we'd be here all night. Um, these guys have just amazing songs and so does the wood thrush too. They have these beautiful lyrical songs. It sounds a bit like an organ. It's because they have two sets of pipes throat pipes, so they can do a couple of notes at the same time. So this is absolutely stunning, stunningly beautiful song. So although this is called a northern water thrush, it's a warbler. And this is uh, another one of the birds that breeds out, on that, uh, out at this location. So you can often hear these guys in May, if you go like mid-May, these guys are gonna be there just singing away and it's uh, once again a beautiful song. A plain bird, but I'm not gonna do the dance. <laughs> uh, th uh, this is a, a warbling vireo which has a, like a, this beautiful, uplifting, happy song when it sings. It just, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Carol wants, I, I, she's got a game she wants to play sometimes with my wife. It's, it's, so I, I, I do like bird dances sometimes and imitations. This is one of the ones I really love to do. <laughs> the, the warbling video, because it has such this, this elegant, beautiful, beautiful, I'm not embarrassing myself in front of so many people. No. <laughs> Let's move on. 
Oh no, it's not going to let me move on. <laughs> All right. So this is a gray cat bird. When I first heard this bird, I actually thought it was a cat. I was in somebody's yard and I heard this, and it was then it was this bird, and it really does. One of its calls really does sound like a cat. As you can see, plenty of food. All right, that's an eastern wood peewee, another one of our another one of our flycatchers. And this is our largest flycatcher that we have. That, this is another good spot, an excellent spot for these. This is the great crested flycatcher. Really beautiful yellow in the belly, and it has this really nice rufous, rufous crown to it. And our smallest flycatcher. This is the least flycatcher, and this is like half the size of that other one. More owls. <laughs> so this was down there. I found this guy because... Um, other birds don't like owls because they're predators, so they chase them. Crows will really, really, crows and blue jays and stuff, but crows will really mob these guys. Um, although this is an aggressive bird, a great horned owl, this guy was sitting in this tree, and I, I, didn't, I didn't know it was there, but I just heard the crows, and there were a lot of them going crazy, and they were all gathering somewhere, so I wound my way, got good wet feet, and went out, in, out there, and, and this guy was there. And the tree around him was surrounded by crows, and there was a raven there too. But the crows would get, he would sit there and he'd just ignoring them for a while, and they would, so they would get complicit, you know, they'd get a little closer and a little closer and at him, and every once in a while they'd just go like this, and then they would all disappear and then come back. But they did eventually chase him away. More warblers. This one's a Blackburnian warbler. And we're going to start to see these guys too. And uh, this spot is excellent for this bird. This is a brown creeper. And find them in the spring or the fall. I don't know what happens like in the summer. They just seem to blend in and disappear. They have a very melodic and, and high-pitched, short but beautiful song. It's a fairly small bird, but they have a really interesting habit when they're feeding. They'll drop down to the base of a tree and often spiral around it up and sometimes just go straight up but around it up and then they'll drop down again to the base of another one so if you're trying to tr they're phenomenally hard to photograph too yeah not only beautiful looker but a beautiful singer it, it was if somebody taught a robin how to sing properly <laughs> Can, you, if you listen to a robin that bird is drunk <laughs> All right, my favorite bird of any bird I've ever seen anywhere in the world. And my trigger bird. This got me back. Birders have often what's called a trigger bird. And a trigger bird is something that you see that makes you want to find more. And for me, it's the scarlet tanager. And I never get tired of seeing them. They really like oak trees. And this is a good spot for oak trees. I mean, you will find them in other spots. And they, they are in the valley. They're there all the time. And you would think you would see that bird. But no, I mean, they're not easy to find. Um, they're, they're, they have a song, it's a little like a robin with a sore throat, the song. Um, but I saw this when I moved to Guelph in my parents' backyard, and I was a teenager then. And I birded as a kid, and you know, as a teenager, I wasn't birding anymore. Um, but I saw this and I wanted to see some more, so it kind of got me going. And then many years later, I saw it again, and you know, now I'm an addict. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, my other pet name for this bird is the black-winged redbird. <laughs> yeah, an American bittern. <laughs> so I, I love these guys just because they think they're smart. So he has seen me, so he's doing that, right? And what he'll do if you see one doing this, and you can see their camouflage blends in really well, but because they think they're smart, when you move around them, they go like this, and they follow you. So they keep this one profile towards you the whole time. So if you didn't see them before, you'll see them move. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to move on to the, the last of the habitat. I just took one picture of it because it's the big lake, <laughs> and it kind of looks big lakey everywhere. And we're fortunate to have it because, of course, it does bring lots of great birds in. 
Last year, this guy hung out in Thornbury. So this is a snow goose. This is the one, and we don't get many of them here because their flyways are a little further east down to Water and those places that, that when they're heading south, but that's, the, that's a, a, a light morph, a white morph snow goose. They also come in a blue color. But this guy hung around Thornbury for months and months and months. And this is a better shot of the northern pintail because you're most likely to find them out on, out on big water. And common terns, we do get a couple, of, we get three kinds of terns really here more than anything. Caspian terns are the big ones with the orange bill. And Forster's terns, which look really similar and you can kind of tell them when they're flying because of their coloration under the wings. All right, I'm, it's, it's rank time again. That is a beautiful bird. That is a double crested cormorant. That bird is a conservation success story in Ontario. It was almost extinct and it got brought back by conservation efforts and now it's thriving. The largest colony of double crested cormorants in the world is in Tommy Thompson Park and the Les Leslie Spit in Toronto. It, is, it was deemed a couple of years ago by the powers that rule our province that this bird is now a nuisance and you're allowed to kill it. You don't have to eat it and you're allowed to kill 50 a day and you can just leave them there because cottagers wind and wind and wind that they were killing trees, well they do. They move into an area in a colony and they eat fish so they've got pretty oily poop and they poop a lot and it will take out most of the vegetation there. That's also fertilizer, right? Guano, like the Europeans were in North America collecting guano and taking it back to use as fertilizer for years and years. So this bird has gone from almost extinct back to a thriving population and now we're allowed to kill it for no reason other than cottagers and sports fishermen were whining about it. So don't get mad at that bird. If it, if it takes up residence on Lake Eugenia and it's going to, uh, at some point, and it's going to kill a bunch of trees in the area where it lives. It's just what nature does. This is doing what nature does. This bird comes in there, and then at some point it'll move on and be somewhere else, and eventually that site will come back and be thriving. And it, a really cool-looking bird. If you ever get a chance to look inside its mouth at this time of year, its mouth is blue, like just vivid blue. And this is the bird that should be saved, not the mute swan. <laughs> I know, I rant a bit, don't I? <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is a better picture of the bufflehead because we get lots and lots and lots of those out on, on Georgia Bay on the lake. And he's probably the smallest of the diving ducks that we get. And it's probably the smallest of the dabbling ducks. This is a green-winged teal. And the aptly named redhead. And... Georgian Bay, in certain parts, brings rare birds in. And although this one isn't in its adult colors, this is a juvenile. This is a little blue heron. Uh, and its, its uh, general habitat is way further south than us. And this one arrived in Collingwood uh, last fall, and he was there for about four days. And I was, I was really lucky. I walked out. I walked up to the edge of the water. Oh, there it is. And he was just sitting, sitting right there. And once again, the great blue heron. And I think this is probably the rarest bird up here that I've seen in the valley. This is a tricolored heron. And he arrived once again in Collingwood off um, what's called the Heather Pathway around that area. And he was there for about three or four weeks. And its range is basically like Florida, a little bit up the coast from there, but it's a very, very, very southern bird. And as we they're called uh, vagrants, birds like this. It probably got caught on a wind or just followed some other birds and then just happened to end up here. But normally you would see this like in way more tropical climes. Another one of our grebes. This is the largest grebe we have here. This is the red neck grebe. And they come through in pretty large numbers too. Usually you've got, got to go quite a way up the Bruce to see them. Up at Cabot Head and around there they are. But they do stop here. And I actually caught one of these guys completely by accident one day at the sewage lagoons. And this is the, uh, the other one of our little greaves. This is a horn grebe. 
Now, this is a male in full breeding colors. If you see that bird in the fall, you wouldn't know it was the same bird. It's mainly white and a bit of black and gray. But it does have that really piercing red eye. All right, more gulls. So, oh, I think it worked. I'm going to use it, Tim. Yay. This is probably the most common bird you'll see all summer here. This is a ring-billed gull. And this is about the average size of a bird. The bird on the left, that is the largest gull in the world. That's a great black back gull. It's like a dog with wings, that thing, when it takes off. It's a, it's a big bird. It's a bit further down the beach, and it look, still looks way bigger than that bird. If you actually see them right next to each other, it's, it's a monster, that bird. Absolutely beautiful to see, though. And they, they can get pretty aggressive at other birds. I saw one um, kill and eat a hooded meganza one day. Just pecked it in the top of the head until... So these are birds also that are in their winter plumage. These are uh, black scudders. And they're another, that they like the big open water. Some of these birds that you see in here, you probably won't catch in Lake Eugene and places like that. They really like these big open waters. And this one, yeah, not the best. That's a white wing scudder. And that's an adult male with his full colors and his beak in, in breeding color. And a little tiny duck. That's a ruddy duck. These things are adorable. In the breeding season, that bill on the male turns blue, really blue. And they bob around on the water. And another one of the Arctic ducks. So this is the long-tailed duck. And the one in the front is a female, and these two are males. These are in their winter non-breeding plumage, which I kind of actually prefer. They look, their, their breeding plumages, the males will go very much similar in the body to the female, and the head gets really black all the way over. But I really like this and the little pinky in the beak. So another one of our occasional but rare birds, this is a Ross's goose. So this, this goose isn't much bigger than a mallard. It's a pretty, pretty, pretty small bird. Well, it's bigger than a mallard, but not much. And he's got a crooked smile. His beak is closed, but he has that really nice crooked smile. Oh, all right, so I saved this one till the end. This is generally like a sea duck. Uh, especially on the west coast and stuff. But they are getting more and more of them in the winters here. This is a harlequin duck. So that male is almost fully colored up. And that's a female long-tailed duck behind it. So the last few years, there's, um, there's been one up on the Bruce Peninsula in the winter. And in the bay in Collingwood, there's been both males and females. Uh, last year, there were three at the mouth of the river in Thornbury. A male and two females, which was really, really great to see. So I believe that's the end of my pictures. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do. We're gonna, should we do some questions, or did I talk too much? You talked uh, just fine. Um, <laughs> words fail me. <laughs> So I'm going to ask uh, Tammy Green to come up and thank you for oh. all your work tonight. <laughs> Tammy Green, thank you. She's the one who tried to get me to do the dance. <laughs> well, after you thank me, we'll do some questions and answers. No, I'm not doing the dance. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I need a mic. <laughs> yeah, because they, they videotape. Okay. Microphone. Um, I have the pleasure of knowing David through birding, and I'm one of those birders and trainers, trainers in training, and I've been a birder in training for four years, and I don't know if I'll really get out of that stage. But the thing I love the most about birding with David is his patience. He is so kind. And I ask all the time, what's that bird? What's that bird? Oh my gosh, can you hear that? That beautiful sound, what is it? And to take something from a friend, that's the beautiful song of the American Robin. <laughs> <laughs> and David will tell me that over and over and over again because he's so patient and, and I get red and embarrassed and I should know a Robin by now, but apparently 
tells me all the time Robins have many, many songs and that it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. David's also great with his ears because he will hear something and that we don't hear. But then once you, know, you see him perk and he goes silent and still and then you will hear it too. And he'll explain it, what they're doing and how they're making that sound to try and it's supposed to stick in our brains so that we can hear it again next time and know what we're talking about. But every time we go and we're birding, we will hear and see so many more birds because David has heard them first. And then he knows where to look and how to find them. And he's been passing that on to us. And one day, I'll call myself an actual birder, but I'm still a birder in training. And I get the pleasure of birding with David a lot. So David, for tonight and sharing like your... The pictures are stunning, but this is a very, 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 very cut down version of all the pictures that he has. David is a great photographer and takes tons of pictures, and any bird you want to see that's in the area at all, ask him, and he will share a picture with you. Throw it on the Beaver Valley page or something, because he's got them all. Thank you very much for being a friend of mine and a great birder, and thank you for sharing with everybody your knowledge and your pictures. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Oh, yeah. Actually, I have three questions, but again, David. Yeah. Question number one is a confirmation that every picture that we saw tonight was taken by you. Yeah. Which I'm assuming they were. Yeah. Uh, question number two is you mentioned, and you said a lot of bird names, but I'm not going to remember, but the, um, the one that you're saying is more of a tropical bird, I forgot the Hollywood area. Yeah, yeah. So the four days. You mentioned the four days. So how wide is your local birding contact, because it must have been somebody must have said, hey David, I've seen this bird, you got to come take a look, or there must have been a, a page or a Facebook page or something that, that you saw that said, I have to take a look at this. So where do you get your tips? eBird. So eBird is um, citizen science run by Cornell Ornithology Labs, and it's where birders go and list the birds that they've seen, and then eBird collects data all this data that gets fed in, so they know population and movement of birds everywhere in the world. But they also have a thing called a rare bird alert. So if you see a rare bird, it gets flagged. And you can sign up for different areas, and you'll get a notification in an email to say, da da da, we're seeing. Now, sometimes that bird is considered rare because it's the wrong time of year, or it's too early in the year, and sometimes it's that. And sometimes, it's not anything because the person who reported it was mistaken. <laughs> that happens quite a bit. But and there's all, there are a couple. There's, there's also a site called Discord and um, Ontario Bird Alerts. Is there any more, Eric? Is there any more than those? Discord and. Yeah, yeah, and but, so and yeah, so birders stay connected like that. And um, it is a great way. So I, I get notifications from Gray County, Bruce County, Simcoe, and Wellington, because that's all relatively close. I've kind of stopped what's called chasing birds as much. So that's if you see a rare bird, and then you've got to go find it. I mean, I'll do it locally sometimes, but I've now decided I want to find them. That was kind of my last question. <laughs> is there still a, a bird bucket list? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, when I was a kid, I, st I, was, I started birding when I was really young in England. And in England, everybody has this little book. It's called the Observer's Book of Birds. And it's a tiny little book, and I had one of those, and I looked to it. And there was a bird in there that I completely fell in love with. It's called the hoopoe. And it lives mainly in um, southern Europe, but occasionally it would stray into England. So there's always talk about this hoopoe, and this hoopoe, and this hoopoe. And it's, it's my number one bucket lid bird, so. And apparently they love wineries. So, but they love the, the winery fields and being a wine geek, you know. <laughs> yeah. David, I think you probably saw the picture that I posted on Facebook of my leucistic chickadee. Yeah, yeah. I kind of worry about him. The other chickadees don't like him. Yeah, he looks different. Yeah. Yeah, he's an oddball. He's going to be an artist. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, it, you, you, you do see that. Um, 
leucistic, leucistic bird, it, that means that it has, it's not an albino, but it has a lot of white plumage. So a lot of birds get that. Um, chickadees, I've seen them in other places as well, chickadees that have that. And sometimes they're okay with other birds, but a lot of the time, yeah, it's, it's looked, I guess it gets frowned on by the other chickadees. But it'll be okay, like it, it, it doesn't weaken him, like a, a true albino is often weaker because it has weak eyesight. Um, and you can tell the difference because it doesn't have pink eyes. And sometimes they're not completely white, just part of it will be white. But there's also a reverse to that called melanistic which means they get dark feathers. Like, they get much, much darker feathers as well. Everybody else is singing and looking for a mate, and nobody wants him. I know. Oh, poor little girl. <laughs> <laughs> It'll find some friends. <laughs> yep. Anybody else? Question in the back. Question in the back. Raving in the green. <laughs> oh, I know that guy. <laughs> What does it mean when they give a bird a title of greater or lesser? Generally, size. But you can't say that for scalp. Um, scalp, scalp, sorry, I got an accent and sometimes my pronunciation of the name sounds a little strange. Um, now, scalp, do you know why they're separated? Aggressive and later scarp. I like the others are generally through size. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the other bird, the real bird and expert in the room. <laughs> um, but there the, are the ducks called a greater scarp and a lesser scarp. And they're really, really similar, but there's a slight differences. And I, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just to separate the two through name. But generally, like the, gresser, the greater and lesser yellow legs, it is size. Like the greater yellow legs is quite a bit bigger than the lesser yellow legs. And the great black back gull is noticeably larger than the lesser black back gull. Yep. In the balcony, we have oh, time. Oh, we've got one in the balcony. What is the best time of the day to go looking in the Kimberley sewage lagoons? In May, like in May and June, as early as you can possibly get there like daybreak. Um, also though, I mean, that's a very popular time with birders because you, you catch them singing. They're coming out of sleep and they start singing so you can really find them that way. Mm. But birds are there all the time. During the heat of the day, like in the heat of the summer, like two o'clock through till the evening, till the early evening, you won't find anything in the heat of the day because they're usually sheltering. At this time of year, you can pretty much get away with any time. Like, I'm, I'm not getting out until 10, 11 sometime, this time of year sometimes, and I'm still finding quite a few birds. But, like, during, like, peak migration in, uh, through May and the beginning of June, I would say as early as you could possibly get there. Yeah. And there were great, great vantage points at the lagoons. So you, you can stay on the out. You don't, you, you don't go in, right? And we don't want to go in because otherwise we won't be able to go there anymore. So you can walk around the edge of the wired off parts, and through the other wooded parts and stuff. It's just, and then you can see over the fences enough to see into that spot. And you, the ducks are disappearing right now because they're all, they're all leaving. So you'll find mallards and, a, and Canada geese and a couple of things there. But like the other birds, that'll be in the trees here. Yeah. I'd say get, as, get there as early as you can, sort of from now until June. We have time for one more question. Um, oh, you that lady, because she's had her hand up the longest. Oh, it's Alfreda. Hi, Alfreda. <laughs> Yeah. They came to our farm last year. There were five people. They would be there at 4 o'clock in the morning till 1 o'clock in the afternoon, camouflaged, looking for these grassland birds. And they found 66 <coughs> species of birds on our farm, including your red-headed woodpecker. Oh, and I also have a red-bellied woodpecker at my bird feeder now all oh, winter. Wicked. So, um, Hannah's in here somewhere. Hannah, are you still working for them? Yeah, yeah, so there's a lady who actually works for that group. That group is doing fantastic things up here for grassland species. They're um, not only doing surveys, but they're also doing education with farmers and working with farm people and other people to like, protect habitat and stuff like that. There's a lot of that stuff going on. We didn't cut hay last year till August. <sighs> Good for you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, David. Well, I guess we're gonna do it. You better stick around. We have some.
draws. Oh, yeah, we got to see If draws. David didn't answer your question, uh, yeah, get me afterwards. He, will, uh, he will be in the lobby uh, to talk to you after this presentation. Speaking of the lobby, this would be a good time to mention that Highland Grounds Excellent Coffee is still available in the lobby, so you can go out now, get some, and bring it back in here with you. I'm sure David would agree that people in Flesherton are raven about Highland Grounds Coffee. But I digress. <laughs> Uh, in the tradition of the Friends of the South Grey Museum, there are four door prizes to be won this evening. So I'm going to ask Steve Plenner to, to come to the stage and help Mr. Turner draw the winning flicker uh, ticket. Sorry. Now this first one is uh, given uh, by Kevin Land of the Speaking Volumes Books and Audio Store here in Marka. He's kindly donated this first prize. Good guy, great store, great audio, excellent vinyl collection. So, Steve, if you would... Uh... Yeah, this is a great book, by the way. Um, scientific names of birds, like I was talking about, which gives you the correct pronunciation of the name and then tells you what it means. So Let's hope a birder gets it. That's an excellent, yeah, really, because like, especially a nerdy bird. Um, <laughs> here's for the nerd. So we do the last three numbers? Yes. Uh, the winning ticket is 433820. 433820. Oh, come on, somebody. Is he making a run for it? Yeah. He did not win the prize. Okay, let's draw another one, Steve. We are 433835. 433835. Boy, this is getting exciting. Obviously, now. I'm meant to have it. <laughs> yeah. Let's try again. We are 433778. Oh. Yes! Yay. <laughs> Marty from Flesherton, congratulations. Now, the, um, the next three prizes are part of a popular birder mystery series uh, by noted birder and mystery author Steve Burroughs. These three books are from the library of Barry Penhill and Jane Gibson, who are conspicuous by their absence this evening as Barry just had carpal tunnel syndrome surgery yesterday, but they're watching from home. Hi, Barry. Don't wave back with that bandaged arm. Okay, so the first uh, of, uh, bird book, uh, mystery book, is A Siege of Bitterns. That's what you call a flock of bitterns. I don't know whether you know, but like flocks of birds all have different names. So it's a siege of bitterns. That's the first book. Okay, the let's get up. Catherine is going to hold the book. Thank you. I'm going to read it. 433773. Tammy. Tammy won. Have you read it, Tim? <laughs> Not yet. Good. Good. Uh, the next one is a tiding of magpies. That's true, too? Yeah. That's what they yeah, call yeah, it? He's a, he's a phenomenal bird, Steve Burroughs. Oh, cool. All right. Uh, we have 433795. 795. We have a winner. Jenny won a tiding of magpies. And now the final one a shimmering of hummingbirds. I like that. I like that. There's some great, Who are we gonna there's some great ones. A, a parliament of owls. 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 God. For a shimmering of hummingbirds, we have 433750. 750. Yes, we have a winner. And it's Alex one, a shimmering of hummingbirds. 
And that concludes our draw and the evening. Except we have to thank again uh, Sean and Renee of Highland Grounds for their donation of the best coffee ever. And thanks to Kevin Land at Speaking Volumes for donating the draw. And also to Jane and Barry for their three contributions to tonight's draw. And for all their work pulling this e event together, let us thank the tireless Steve and Catherine Planner of their friends in the South Grey Museum. Bless you. And to all the friends of the South Grey Museum that I see lurking about in the crowd there. This is a Middle Grey Events production. Better watch their website for more upcoming events. And be sure to join us again on Thursday, May the 16th, when the noted canoeist, environmentalist, and outdoor educator Bob Henderson will be our guest. Bob's highly illustrated program is titled Paddling Pathways, and it's going to delight all the outdoor enthusiasm, especially the canoeists. So save the date, Thursday, May 16th. And finally, before he turns the lights out, let's have a big round of applause for the man behind the console in the balcony, the man who let there be light and sound, the incomparable Tim Riley. Thanks to David Turner. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a good evening.